Good, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. We're going to begin our study with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for the Sabbath hours and for the fellowship that we can have, whether in person or even online. And uh, for the things that you have been teaching us that we are grateful for that bring a conviction uh, and that lead to confession and repentance, we can see our need of you. And we pray for each person who is searching into the truth, who is stretching their mind and their energies to understand your will for them personally and the role that you have for them in sharing the truth with others. We know, Lord, as we share with others, we are strengthened. We know we are weak. Without you, we can do nothing. And we know, Lord, that as we continue to look into these things on righteousness by faith, um, we are encouraged, even when we see the difficulties before us. Be with us now through thy spirit as we study together. And may the Sabbath day be blessed, and may each of us be blessed. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening again. Happy Sabbath. Now, remember last Sunday, I was supposed to, or was it, I, I can't remember exactly how it happened, but I was supposed to read number nine, and I ended up reading number eight of A.T. Jones' presentations, or the other way around. I was supposed to read number eight, and I ended up reading number nine. Thank you, dear. And so, but I thought it was providential. I guess it was last Friday. And because we have a study uh, tomorrow at two o'clock, because it's the Canadian group's study time. <clears throat> Um, so we're going to read number eight this week. So we're not reading them in order. And we didn't really finish number nine exactly, but um, we finished it enough uh, to come back to number eight. Now, Jones has been dealing with the whole issue of this Sunday law that's coming and what we need to be prepared. Basically, the Sunday law is not going to come just because it arbitrarily just pops along on this road. We have to actually be traveling down this road. God's people have to be prepared. And so as he has started with this, what was happening politically, where he believes that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down in 1893, um, we know that he's paralleling our history. But... Um, he's now really moving much more directly into the understanding of righteousness by faith. So we're going to start reading here. And I know this is quite a bit different than our morning studies where we, we, we have a lot more back and forth discussion, but there's no reason that people can't step in if they have a point. Now, some people like to put things in the chat and that can be very, very helpful. But for those who are, watching these meetings after they've been recorded. Um, I know sometimes people will comment, they might send me an email, uh, they might uh, make a note in uh, WhatsApp, but I actually really prefer people put questions they have on the videos themselves, because then I can answer them and other people who are watching that video might uh, be interested in that. And uh, so if there ends up being a discussion regarding a particular video, it's nice if it's attached to the video. <clears throat> so this is number eight, A.T. Jones at the 1893 General Conference. The evidences have been given to us, showing over and over that we stand in the very presence of the events that bring the end of the world. This is something that we truly have seen um, within this movement, not just what's happening out there in the world, 
but also the line that we are on, the experience that we are having in this movement. Over and over, evidences have been presented from the Bible and direct statements of the Lord in testimony that now is the time when we must have the power by which alone the message may be given to the world to save such as will be saved from the ruin that comes from the events that are about us. And you can see how this movement, we believe that this is our responsibility, that this has been the responsibility that's been entrusted to us. And what are we doing to fulfill this responsibility? I mean, we feel completely inadequate uh, to accomplish anything. I mean, we can hardly, in ministering to those around us, which takes years, God is asking us to do a work in warning the world. Um, it seems way beyond us. Brethren, and brethren, the dangers that threaten us as to the end of the world, persecutions and those things from without are, and always are, very little compared to the dangers that hang over each individual in his individual experience. Voices in the audience, that is so. Jones goes on, the great danger that there is about this congregation and with our people everywhere is that they will not see the things which concern them individually, but will look more at the things that are without and at the evidences of those things than they will to see that their own hearts are right with God. They will look more at these things as a sort of theory than they will to have a living Christ within, in order that all those things may be living realities without, and that we may be prepared to meet them in the fear of God and in the salvation of God. That is the greatest danger, as I said, that there is with this congregation who are here, and we may spread the congregation to take in every professed Sabbath keeper in the world. So we can see that danger, right? So what Jones is talking about, it's easy to look at what's happening without. We can get all kinds of messages from people talking about the vaccine and the, va and the pandemic and Trump and all these different things that are happening out there in the world. But we're not taking our time to focus upon the, the thing that's the most necessary, and that is our preparation for those things that are coming upon the world. <clears throat> so Jones goes on. And now we have come in the study of this subject to the study of that part of it that comes right down to you and me as individuals, the things that you and I need to do and the things that we need from God to look at these things and act upon them in view of the salvation of God that is concerned in these things to you and me. To me, from what I know and what I know that I know, to me, this lesson, and the next one are the most fearful of all that I've been brought to yet. I have not chosen them, and I dread them. But brethren, as Brother Prescott brought before us the other night, it is no use to slight anything. It is no use for us to tamper with these things. It is no use for us to view these things lightly. It is no use for us to walk these days with our eyes shut and not knowing what our situation is. It is no use for us to have our expectations raised by the truth of God as it does raise men's expectations and we be expecting things to come. And yet difficulties in our own heart and lives prevent those things doing us a particle of good when they do come. It is no use for us to do that, is it? I say again that the lessons to which I have come and which will have to be given, that is settled, are to me the most fearful in the realities of the things which they tell and the situation in which they place us, of any that I have had anything to do with yet in my personal teaching, then I can say again, I dread it. I dread it because of some of the consequences that I fear it will have, because it is not being received as it should be, with the heart and mind subdued before God, asking him alone whether these things are so. Now, I don't know how many of you can identify with that dread, 
but we dread sometimes to present things that we know are not being well received. He goes on, some things may not be pleasant for all to hear, as they are not pleasant for me to relate. They apply so personally to us as individuals. But brethren, where we stand in the situation in which we stand and in the fear of God, it has to be done. And as it shall be done, I ask you. Now, to start with, do not place me up here as one who is separated from you and excluding myself from the things that may be presented. I'm with you in all these things. I, with you, just as certainly and just as much, need to be prepared to receive what God has to give us as anybody else on earth. So I beg of you not to separate me from you in this matter. And if you see faults that you have committed, I shall see faults that I've committed. And please do not blame me if these things are brought forth that expose faults that you have committed. Please do not blame me as though I were judging you or finding fault with you. I shall simply state facts. And you who have been, who have a part in these things, will each one know that it is a fact for himself as when it concerns me and myself in these things. I shall know that it concerns me as a fact. What I want, brethren, is simply to seek God with you with all the heart. The congregation says amen. And to have everything out of the way that God may give us what he has for us. I shall not try. And you no, need not expect me to try to go very fast because I shall be willing to go just as slow as it may be that we may consider all these things carefully. It will take these lessons to present what is in my mind to be presented. So let us simply study these things together. I will begin <coughs> with the thought where we stopped last night. The thought was before us that the time has come when God has promised to give the early and latter rain. The time has come when we are to ask for it and to expect it, and we may keep in mind the lesson and the testimony that Brother Prescott brought before us the other night on the same subject. So remember, um, Brother Caldwell and Brother Stan, St what was his name, Stanton, that Alan White had received a letter from Brother um, called well in Australia where he was talking about the former and the latter rain but Ellen White um, responded to him very differently that is he was calling the church Babylon calling people out of the church and also he was um, misinterpreting scripture where she said that he needed even though he was at these meetings he did not receive the benefit from them <coughs> So, so when we think about this early and latter rain, this is a big part of our movement. So we've dealt with it a little bit um, and in, in some of our other studies as well. So anyway, Jones goes on. I, I read tonight that passage that I referred to last night, but did not have the book here. It is in the ministry of Peter and conversion of Saul, page nine. After telling about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the day of Pentecost and the results in the conversions of souls, etc. It says, this testimony in regard to the establishment of the Christian church is given us not only as an important portion of sacred history, but also as a lesson. All who profess the name of Christ should be waiting, watching, and praying with one heart. All differences should be put away, and unity and tender love, one for another, pervade the whole. Then our prayers may go up together to our Heavenly Father with strong, earnest faith. Then we may wait with patience and hope for the fulfillment of the promise. So here we're talking about the fulfillment of the promise, which is the latter rain, correct? That's what we're being asked uh, to prepare for, to pray for. So when we talk about the latter rain, we know that we have to be together in unity in the upper room, right? Or at least we have to be in the upper room first and go out in unity to receive the latter rain. 
correct? Can we get the latter rain without the upper room? No. No, we can't. And, and if we don't have the latter rain, do we have a message? We have no message whatsoever. Yeah, exactly. And, and if we, as a movement, claim that we have a message, but we haven't gone to the upper room, then we're liars, correct? Amen and amen. So we know that this, this is exactly where the church was in 1893. And this is where this movement is presently. And did the, did the church go to the upper room? Did they complete that work that they needed to do? Not in any manner. Not in any manner. Well, we know that a work was being done here in 1893, that hearts were touched and the work was begun, but that work did not con continue. And it was because of politics, right? Policy over principle, correct? Yes, correct. There was infighting going on. Infighting amongst the ministers and the medical work. There was all kinds of uh, ideas about who's controlling what. The institutions of the church. Who's controlling the medical work. Right? Who's controlling the printing press. Right. People thinking of themselves more highly than they ought to. Thinking that God has entrusted them. That they've been given gifts. And so this is something that we can't do. We can't afford to do. Right? And that's why we've been really, in, in trying to deal with this division that has occurred in the movement, we've dealt with it in a very specific way. We've followed the counsels that have been given us. We've invited people to study, and we've been willing to study with anyone because we want to know what the truth is. But we have to come to that point in this movement. If we... If we can't understand what this message is, I don't know how any of us can even move forward. We will just go backwards. Because that's what happens, right? We go back to the world. Sometimes it's quickly, sometimes it's slowly. But if you're not moving forward, you're going backwards. When does that then come in? When we are waiting watching and praying with one heart and all differences put away unity and tender love one for another pervading the whole therefore brethren if there are any differences at all between you and any of the people on this earth whether they are at this institute or not it is time for you and me to get them out of the way if the person is not here so that you can go to him and talk talk it over you write him and tell him all about it and tell him your position and what you are doing. You have no responsibility any further for him, whether he receives it or not. You have acted in the fear of God and what he tells you to do. Question from someone in the audience. Do you mean people of the world, everybody? Yes, I say everybody. Because if there are sins between me and people that are outside, they know it. And those differences will hinder our approach to them when we go with the message. Though God should even give to us his spirit in the outpouring of the latter rain. Any difference, any enmity, anything of that kind that is between me and anybody of the world, don't you see that will hinder me from approaching him with the message? And if we have cheated people and have not been honest in our deal with the people and have not been honest in our transactions before the world, why for our soul's sake, brethren, let us straighten up. And here in Battle Creek, Perhaps there are people that have things of the, that kind to do toward the people of this city. I mean, our own people toward the people of this city. Our meetings are going on in this city for the people of this city. And it was told us here in the Institute that it is expected that when the blessing of God would come upon this meeting, it was to be taken to the people of this city, and they are to share with us in this thing. And then I would say to the Seventh-day Adventists in the city, straighten up where there are crooked things for your own soul's sake and for the sake of souls whom God wants to save in this city. Straighten up. If you've been cheating people, go and confess it to them and give back what you stole. 
if in your business transactions you have not been straight, if you've got anything in a grasping way, undo the wickedness, stand straight in the sight of God. Here is the word to us. All differences should be put away in unity and tender love. One for another pervade the whole. That is what the disciples were doing when they sought the Lord those 10 days. They put away all differences. Now, don't you suppose that in those 10 days that the other disciples who were so envious of James and John when they went and asked by their mother, the Savior let them sit one on one side and the other on the other side of him in, in the kingdom of God, and the rest of the disciples did not like it? Don't you suppose they put away all that thing? and confessed it and talked it over with one another and saw themselves how mean it all was. The Savior took that little child and said, whosoever will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven shall become as this little child and shall become the servant of all. These things they were putting away, those differences and those envyings for fear that one would be greater in the kingdom of God than some of the other disciples were all put away. And we have the word here that those things are amongst us, ambition for place, jealousy of position, and envy of situation. Those things are amongst us. Now the time has come to put them away. Now the time has come for each one to find how low he can get at the feet of Christ, and not how high in the conference or in the estimation of men, or how high in the conference committee, um, or general conference committee. That is not the question at all. All differences should be put away, and unity and tender love, one for another, pervade the whole. Now, when we think about this, you know, we're reading what Jones is saying, and we think about this in our own situation. How much effort have we made to talk to those who we feel have hurt us, or that we have hurt that feel hurt by us. How much effort have we made? I mean, we might have done something. We might have talked to somebody, maybe on the phone or wrote them an email. But the question that we have to ask is how much have we done? Have we really done this work? Have we gone there with accusations? Or have we been honest with what we have done in our communication with them? These are things that we have to consider. If this upper room is to be a reality, it's not something that somebody else has to do. It's something that we have to do. As this pertains particularly to us, Jones goes on, as brethren and sisters in the church, as brothers and sisters in this movement, right? It becomes us, if we know of any difference between us and anybody in this world, to get it out of the way. No difference what it costs. That has nothing to do with it. It cannot cost our life if we do it. It will cost our life if we do not do it. That is settled. And when that is done, then our prayers may go up together to our Heavenly Father with strong, earnest faith. Yes, sir. When you know that you are clear in the sight of God, so far as anything is possible for you to get out of the way, between you and your brethren, and everything confessed to God that he has shown, and we hold ourselves before him as the erring, helpless, undone sinners that we are, and see our need of what he has to give, then there are all his promises, and they are for us, and we know that they are our promises. Then we can depend upon them, and then our prayers may go up together to our Heavenly Father with strong, earnest faith. Then we may wait with patience and hope the fulfillment of the promise. That is what there is now to do. Then that thing is done when all those differences are put away and unity prevails. And each one is seeking unity of heart and mind. Then God has promised that we shall see eye to eye. The time has come. Let us do it. Now, for anybody who's read, read um, A.T. Jones' 1895 General Conference Bulletins, in that uh, series, he's going to deal with the enmity that exists, the middle wall of partition, <coughs> if I remember correctly, <coughs> that needs to be removed, and that you can't just reconcile you know, man with man. You have to reconcile man with God. Now, 
So if we think about this, what, what often we have to do and what he's asking us to do, to basically confess our sins one to another, right? To admit our faults. We can't do this without being connected to God. Because the reason why we have unity is because we're united with Christ, correct? Yes, correct. So the unity of heart and mind that that we need, that, that, that then God has promised that we shall see eye to eye. That time has come. Let us do it. So we need to do it. But here in 1893, it's not done. And in 1895, when Jeff when uh, Jones presents his messages in the 1895 General Conference Bulletin. What? That's okay. Um, <clears throat> so when we have the 1895 General Conference Bulletin, it's still not going to be done, right? So Jones is going to be here two years later trying to find out how can we get people to be reconciled to each other. And the problem is we can't, right? There's nothing I can do to get any of you reconciled to any other person. And I can't be reconciled to you if I'm not reconciled to God. So the answer may come with sudden velocity and overpowering might, or it may be delayed for days and weeks and our faith receive a trial. So this is... Uh, on page nine of the book that he's talking about. But God knows how and when to answer our prayer. It is our part of the work to put ourselves in connection with the divine channel. God is responsible for his part of the work. So now, when we're looking at this here, we have our part that we have, and we have God's part. So what is our part? That Ellen White says here, it is our part to do what? What does this passage say? Isn't it our part to put away the differences? Okay, but to do that, we have to put ourselves in connection with the divine channel. Right. Right. So, yeah. So we have to put away, so we have this work to do of confession and repentance. That's the way Ellen White talked about the 1895 gen, or 1893 General Conference meetings that were held, that there was confession and repentance that had begun, right? So, so that had begun. But we also need patience, she talks about, that we may wait with patience and hope the fulfillment of the promise so one is, none of this is going to be hasty. None of this, I mean, obviously we look at the story of the disciples, we see their 10 days in the upper room, and then they come out and the Holy Spirit's poured out. But we don't have that benefit of being their person with the person, all of us together who've been working together for the last three years with Christ. We have all kinds of different experiences all kinds of misunderstandings, distance from one another, stories that we've heard, things that have been exaggerated in our own minds, in our imagination, hurt feelings that are sometimes just uh, imagined from things that have happened. We've been slighted in, in over little things. So all of those things have hindered us. So we need to be connected to the divine channel, to God, and if we do that, God is responsible for his part of the work. That is, is this not yoking up with Christ? Is this not come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest? It has to be that. That's learning in the school of Christ. And, and it's, it's not an easy thing, as Jones is putting out. This is really the cross that he's talking about. So he says, just as the thought came before us last night, when the channel is open and our prayers are ascending as they are described, then the channel is open 
And when the Holy and when the Spirit of God is poured out, it will reach to the full length of the channel that is open. It is our part, again quoting Ellen White, it is our part of the work to put ourselves in connection with the divine channel. God is responsible for his part of the work. He is faithful who hath promised. The great important matter with us is to be of one heart and mind, putting away all envy and malice, and as humble supplicants to watch and wait. Jesus, our representative and head, is ready to do for us what he did for the praying, watching ones on the day of Pentecost. So this is a pretty powerful statement. Here's another thought that is worthy of our deep consideration. So Jones is going to continue reading here. Jesus as, as, is as willing to impart courage and grace to his followers today as he was to the disciples of the early church. None should rashly invite an opportunity to battle with the principalities and powers of darkness. We need to go into that thing carefully with deliberation. We need to be sure and not go into the contest until we know God is with us with the power and grace of God to give us courage and strength to meet those powers with which we are to deal. This contest that is before us is no light thing. When God bids them engage in the conflict, it will be time enough. He will then give the weak and hesitating boldness and utterance beyond their hope or expectations. So Ellen White is saying, if we're weak and hesitating, we can have boldness and utterance beyond our hope or expectation. So we understand that the power comes by being connected with God. Jones goes on. So what the Lord wants us to do is to seek him. And then when he sends us, we go with his power and grace only. On page 11, we read. So this is Spirit of Prophecy, another paragraph. The disciples and apostles of Christ had a deep sense of their own inefficiency and with humiliation and prayer, they joined their weakness to his strength, their ignorance to his wisdom, their unworthiness to his righteousness, their poverty to his inexhaustible wealth. Thus strengthened and equipped, they hesitated not in the service of their master. So they had a deep sense of their own inefficiency. Now, before they had a deep sense of the inefficiency of others, right? They trusted in their own opinions and ideas, their own ambitions. But the disciples lost all that and gained something else. And that was a sense of their own inefficiency. Now, is this difficult? to recognize our own weaknesses? Shouldn't, as Christians, shouldn't we expect to see our faults? We should, but many times we just don't. We, we don't accept it. We, we tend to gloss over our faults. We, we, we excuse them, right? Even if we do see them, we joke about them. Right. Right. They're not a big deal. Other people shouldn't be so offended by it. You know, this is just the way that I am. You know, sometimes people have pointed out that I can be a bit of a jerk. I never take that lightly. Now, I know that I can be a jerk. And I know why it happens. They may not fully understand why it happens. But that doesn't really matter. The fact is, I have to constantly study on how to be effective in presenting the truth. If I'm going to present ideas, I can't just excuse my mistakes. I can't just lightly approach uh, the desk. That responsibility in sharing the truth is not something light. And I have to be aware of my own weaknesses because I need to depend upon God. You know, when you, when you do these presentations, 
doesn't matter how much you know. We don't know en enough. Only God can lead and guide in these presentations and what we're doing. In this movement, it has all been of God, has it not? This hasn't been about human intellect. Human intellect did not create these lines. Correct. Right. Correct. We needed to exercise our intellect to receive that message from God. But it was a message from God, not a message from man. And we also needed to exercise our intellect to understand and accept that message. But none of that recommends us to God. None of that makes us better than anyone else. Because even though we may exercise our intellect, our intellect is weak. Our abilities are, we have many inefficiencies. There's many things that we have done to hurt the cause of Christ personally with our life. And so we have to recognize those things. We need his strength. We need his wisdom. We need his righteousness. We need his wealth. We don't need the wealth of men. We don't need the praise of men. We don't need the wisdom of men. We don't need the righteousness of men, our own righteousness. We don't need the strength of men. Right? All of these things are things that come from God. <clears throat> what an equipment that is, though. Right? So they're thus strengthened and equipped. They hesitate not in the service of their master, Ella White says. So Joan says, what equipment that is, though. Think of that equipment by being equipped, being able to have those things, strength, wisdom, righteousness, and wealth. Those are the very things that we need in the face of the things that are against us, right? So he says, um, so here are almost the very things enumerated that we considered in a previous lesson. But how was it that they obtained strength by acknowledging their weakness, confessing their weakness, so this is one of the most important parts. If we think ourselves strong, are we going to call upon God's strength? If we think ourselves wise, are we going to depend upon God's wisdom? Isn't this the Laodicean condition? Very much. We're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, right? But we think we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And if this movement is going to go anywhere, we're going to have to go there first. Now, then that is the situation in which we are to be inefficient, ignorant, poor, unworthy and blind. Is not that just what the Laodicean message tells us, of course, uh, <clears throat> that we are wretched and miserable, poor and blind and naked and do not know it. So that's the problem is we don't know it. Someone was reading that the other day, and he touched upon the word blindness, and immediately my mind ran to the ninth chapter of John and the last verse. I'll turn to it, if that, if you will, John 941. It is at the end of the account of that man's healing from the blindness and restoration of sight to the man that had been born blind. What does that verse say? Jesus said unto them, if ye were blind, you should have no sin, but now you say, we see. Therefore, your sin remaineth. When Jesus tells you and me we are blind, the thing for us to do is say, Lord, we are blind. He told those folks they were blind and they were blind. But they said it was not so. It was so. If they had confessed their blindness, they would have seen God in that man's healing from his blindness. Well, then, brethren, the thing for us to do is to come square up to that Laodicean message and say, that every word he says is so. When he says you and I are wretched, tell him it is so. I am wretched, miserable. It is so. I am miserable, poor. It is so. I am poor, a perfect beggar. I shall never be anything else in the world. Blind, I am blind and shall never be anything else. Naked, that is so. And I do not know it. That is so too. I do not know it at all as I ought to know it. And then I will say to him every day and every hour, Lord, that is also, but oh, instead of my wretchedness, give me thine own satisfaction. Instead of my misery, give me thine own comfort. Instead of my poverty, supply all thine own riches. 
Instead of my blindness, be thou my sight. Instead of my nakedness, O do thou clothe me with thine own righteousness. And what I know not, Lord, teach thou me. The congregation says, Amen. Brethren, when we have come with one heart and one mind to that place, we shall have no difficulty at all in repenting. It will not be difficult to repent, and there will be no lack of repentance. The next verse will be fulfilled. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. <clears throat> so repentance, of course, is a difficult thing, right? Joan says the difficulty about our not being able to repent is that we have not confessed that what the Lord has told us is the truth. You can't repent of something that you don't believe you need to repent of. In our self-justifications, to build ourselves up, we are building up a fortress against repentance. Definitely we don't want to confess our sins, especially to any man any person that we have hurt. We want them to confess their sins to us, but we don't want to confess our sins to them. When I know that I am wretched, then I know that I need something that will satisfy me. And I know that nothing but the Lord can give that. And I depend upon nothing but him to give it. <coughs> and if I have not him, why it is only wretchedness. Any moment that I have not him, it is only wretchedness. And any moment that I have not his comfort, it is only misery. And any moment that I have not absolute dependence upon his unsearchable riches, the unsearchable riches of Christ, I'm utterly poor. A complete beggar. And every moment that I do not see and confess that I am blind and have him as my sight, I am in sin. He says so. Now you say you see, therefore your sin remaineth. And every moment that I do not see my nakedness and depend only and absolutely upon him and his righteousness to clothe me, why so certainly I am ruined, utterly ruined. And every moment that I begin to say, now I know so much. No, I do not know that at all. Well, then the thing that I am to do, I am to do is to say, Lord, I do not know it. I depend upon thee to teach me everything, even to teach me that I am wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked and that I need all these things. And when I tell him all that, he will give it all I need. He will do it. That is our situation. Here is a passage in volume one of the regular edition of the Testimonies, page 353, which brings before us a wonderful thing. <coughs> so Ellen White says, at the transfiguration, Jesus was glorified by his father. We hear him say, now is the son of man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Thus, before his betrayal and crucifixion, he was strengthened for his dreadful sufferings. As the members of the body of Christ approach the period of their last conflict, the time of Jacob's trouble, they will grow up into Christ and will partake largely of his spirit. But this is true, is it not? That something happens to us? And does it just happen arbitrarily? We're just going along as Seventh-day Adventists and all of a sudden we grow up into Christ and partake largely of his spirit. It's not the no. way it works. No. So, so we have to think about this. What happened to Christ? She goes on, as the third message swells to a loud cry, and as great power and glory attend the closing work, the faithful people of God will partake of that glory. It is the latter rain. Um, it is the latter rain which revives, so that brings to life, right, and strengthens them to pass through the time of trouble. 
Their faces will shine with the glory of that light which attends the third angel. So we know that the loud cry comes after the Sunday law, but we have something that typifies the loud cry, and that is the midnight cry. So we, we have to have the Holy Spirit here now in order to do the work of warning the, the Levites, Seventh-day Adventists, and also in warning the world. So the question is, what is the loud cry for? To strengthen us for the time of trouble. Where are we? Congregation, in the loud cry. Has the loud cry begun? Congregation, yes. What has it begun for, to do a work for us, to enable us to stand in the time of trouble? Right? So he believes that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down. And Ellen White says when that comes down, that's going to be at the Sunday law. So he believes he's at the Sunday law. And he believes that the loud cry has begun because it's it's going to swell into a loud cry. But this angel joins the, the mighty angel of Revelation 18, joins the third angel. And Jones believes he's there. So Jones even believes he's further along the lines than we now believe we are. Was he wrong? I'll ask another question. Were we wrong when we saw that we were at midnight on November 9th, 2019? No, I don't think so. No, we weren't wrong because that is midnight. But where did we know where we were really? Did we know what line we were in? No, I don't think so. Jones, Jones is not wrong, but he's in a line that is typical. Because his line is typifying our line, is it not? That is, his line is a line where he thinks the mighty red angel of revelation has come down. And that that is that point in history that we would now mark as 9-11, right? But we know that even with our 9-11, that that's the beginning of the Sunday law because we're zoomed into the way mark of the Sunday law. We know that 9-11 is not the Sunday law. The Sunday law did not happen at 9-11. And, and we didn't predict 9-11 ahead of time. We understood 9-11 after the fact, right? Took us a couple of years yes. to understand 9-11, what it meant. But we, we then come, came to recognize it meant the mighty angel of Revelation 18 had come down, even though it wasn't the Sunday law. Because Jeff then had a line, 9-11, um, it, you know, it changed over time. But 9-11 became a part of that line. It became the beginning of the line of the three way marks he used to always have. So he'd have 9-11, the Sunday law, the close of probation. And then eventually he had 9-11, the midnight cry, the Sunday law. And then eventually we had those four dates in 1844 lining up with the first day of the first month, fifth day of the fourth month, first day of the fifth month, and the tenth day of the seventh month, lining up as 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. So we, Jones is not wrong. He just doesn't know what line he is in. <clears throat> and Jones must be zoomed into what way, Mark? Is he zoomed into 1888? Yeah, I, I think that's what where he's at. He would have to be, because if he, you know, he, I mean, 1888, of course, is a way mark, and he's here in 1893. But 1888, yeah, but, in a sense, is is maybe like 9-11, and, and 19, 1893 is like the Sunday law, or something like that. I don't know exactly how to that. Yeah, so he doesn't know anything about this, right? Yeah. Right. But he's not wrong. No, we can't he's not back, wrong. Yeah, we can't go back and say, well, A.T. Jones was just completely mistaken because Ellen White endorses what he's saying. Isn't she endorsing it when she says that 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 work that would that Joe that was happening at that camp meeting at that uh, conference, the general conference in 1893, that that was yeah, the that's what's that was, established. Yeah, so she endorses this as the true work, right? 
but this this work of confession and repentance that really the loud cry was beginning. She's really agreeing with Jones. Yes, I agree. Okay. okay. But there's also a counterfeit message, too. That's Brother uh, Canwell and Brother um, Stanton, right, in Australia. Right. <clears throat> so so we can see now that... That's the message... telegraph, right? Yeah. Yeah, they sent the telegram. Yeah. Which we looked at. So now we know here, then, <clears throat> we have this demand for unity, that this is before us, this call for the loud cry, the latter rain. It is this that strengthens us for the time of trouble, and it has already begun. Here is the word. This is the one important thing, to be of one heart and mind. Now, remember what this movement tried to do to bring about unity. How did it try to bring about unity back in uh, 2018, 2017, 2019? Well, how was it trying to bring about unity? How was this movement trying to bring about unity? What did we do? At that time, <clears throat> wasn't wasn't it abandoning some of the prophetic understandings that we'd come to accept? Okay, well, to bring about unity, we organized, right? So we wanted to organize as a church, right? Because we believe in church order, the gospel order, right? So then we had these organizational meetings 2017 they had it in september 2017 and then again in 2018 in italy right so they're doing these organizational meetings and they were trying to they created a ba baptismal vows organizational structure they started appointing elders right even back in 2016 we had the elders appointed right ordained as elders Right. right. And, then, and then we had the doctrinal analysis group. So we're going to get, uh, you know, all the writings approved so that nobody's teaching error. Is that how you bring about unity? No. No. We have to be connected to God individually. We have to be, in, in a sense, they were doing everything that you would want to do if you want to destroy unity. Right. And I've used this example before. At uh, In Warburg Church, we had uh, the Alberta Conference president at the time, I believe it was, um, presenting because it was an anniversary celebration of Warburg Church when it was organized. Uh, I can't remember the 50th anniversary of it. <clears throat> um, and, uh, and, of course, he knew I was in the congregation. And, and he made a statement that the reason why the Alberta Conference is so united is because we remove those who disagree with us. Is that how you bring about unity? No. Well, no. That, that's the uh, papal theory. Yeah. So that doesn't bring about any unity. I mean, eventually you, you can get, I guess, completely united is if you finally remove everyone until you're the only one left. And then you can be united with yourself, but that's not really the type of unity that's going to do any good, right? If you just keep getting rid of people that you disagree with that are disagreeable in your minds, you haven't brought about any unity. You haven't done anything with the gospel. You haven't converted anyone. You haven't even converted yourself. Yeah, you know, they take the uh, separating themselves um it's actually what you're needing to do is separate yourself from sin. Right. Now, and of course you say they, but you're really talking about us, aren't you? Us, us, we. Okay, right. So all I'm, I'm using these other examples, not as something that they're the bad ones and we're the good ones. I'm saying that we made these mistakes as a movement, right? Yes, right. this is true. 
We tried to bring about unity in a way that we couldn't. But there is this, right. you know, and then Joan says, now a little further in regard to that demand for unity that is before us, this call for the loud cry, the latter rain, it is this that strengthens us for the time of trouble. And it has already begun. There is the word that is the one important thing to be of one heart and mind. So we know that this is what has to happen right now. Right. So what are we going to do about it? That's the question that we're trying to understand. Because we're being called to be of one heart and mind, and yet we're divided. So Jones is going to read from this testimony that has not yet been published. He says, I will read a few passages. <clears throat> um, it is sin in some form that brings variance and disunion, right? So as Rana, what you were saying is we have to get rid of this sin, right? So Ellen White says right. it is sin in some form that brings variance and disunion. The affections need transforming. A personal experience of the renewing power of Christ must be obtained. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. The apostle, speaking to Christian believers called by God's grace, says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Here are conditions plainly stated. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the sure result will follow. We shall have fellowship one with another. All jealousies and envyings and evil surmisings will be put away. We shall live as in the sight of an holy God. So Jones goes on. That is, we shall live now, today, each day. We shall live as in the sight of the holy God because our prayers are going up to him to bring his presence by the outpouring of his Holy Spirit. And can go and we and can we go carelessly on in this slip shod way, knowing that there are envies and jealousies and evil surmisings? It has become altogether too common to indulge our hereditary tendencies and natural inclinations, even in our religious life. So this is Alan White now, right? These can never bring peace and love into the soul, for they always lead us away from God, away from his light. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. When these differences arise among brethren, as to the understanding of any point of truth, there is one Bible rule to follow. In the spirit of meekness and love for God and for and one another, let brethren come together and after earnest prayer with sincere desire to know God's will, study the Bible with the spirit of a little child to see how closely they can draw together and not sacrifice anything but their selfish dignity. They should regard themselves as in the presence of the whole universe of God, who are watching with intense interest as brother tries to see eye to eye with brother, to understand the words of Christ, that they may be doers of the word and not hearers only. So the thing is, have we done that? We know as a movement we have not. I agree. We have these differences arising, and we're not following this spirit of meekness and love for God and for one another, right? I mean, that's no, pretty evident. Uh, being against them uh, feeling about this whole thing. Right. And it's not us against them. It's us against ourselves. I mean, I agree. us individually. Because we're the ones who are the ones that we can control. We are the ones who are the enemy. If we're involved in any kind of thing like this, we're not of Christ. We're doing the work of the adversary. So Jones goes on, what is the universe of God doing, brethren? They are watching to see you and me be brethren. They want to see us be brethren. That is what they are doing. 
They are watching to see you be brethren in the church, be brethren and sisters indeed. They are watching to see us see eye to eye. Now, brethren, let us not let them watch in vain. When you recall the prayer of Christ, that his disciples may be, so this is Ellen White again. When you recall the prayer of Christ, that his disciples may be one as he was one with the Father, can you not see how intently all heaven is beholding the Spirit you manifest toward one another? We, Ellen White talked about this at the 1888 General Conference. What was happening? What did she see in vision? About the spirit that was at that conference. Does anybody know? It was not the spirit of God. Yeah, people were mocking. They were mocking Jones and Wagner. Doing his mannerisms, Jones' mannerisms, in a mocking way. To belittle what was being said. In 1888. In 1888, yep. That's what was happening. Ellen White saw this in vision. And, and we know that heaven saw this, right? Correct. So it wasn't just Ellen White. Heaven saw this. And so people have been able to, we have been able to, say things that we wouldn't have said if we knew heaven was watching. But we said them anyway, right? Because we didn't really believe heaven was watching us. All are those who claim to be saved by the righteousness of Christ, seeking with all their entrusted capabilities to answer the Savior, Savior's prayer. That may, we may be one as his father is, he's one with his father, right? Will they grieve the Holy Spirit of God by indulging their own unconsecrated feelings, struggling for supremacy and standing as far apart as possible? The solemn, important hours intervening between us and the judgment are not to be employed in warfare with believers. But this movement right now is in warfare. And it should not be. And, and we don't know what to do about it other than that we have to figure this out on our own where we have departed from God. We can't make somebody else see their sin. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But we can see our own sin. We can allow the Holy Spirit to do the work upon us that needs to be done. So Jones goes on. Brethren, what have we to do to backbite and war against one another? The devil is making war against our brethren. Let us leave that for him. Let us love our brethren. Let us stand by our brethren. When a Seventh-day Adventist even attacks one of our brethren, let us defend him. Let us defend him in the fear of God. My brother's reputation is important to me because if one will attack my brother's reputation to me, he will attack mine to my brother. Now, I'm pretty sure most of you are aware of this type of thing. If you're talking to somebody who's talking to you and telling you about somebody else's sin and how bad they are, one thing you can be certain about that person is that when you're not there and they're talking to some other brother, they're going to be talking the same way about you. Correct? Correct. That's been my experience. And so we never listen to gossip. When somebody tells us something about somebody that's hearsay, what do we say? Have you talked to that brother yourself? Have you reconciled with that brother? If you haven't followed the counsel that God has given, I don't want to hear what you have to say. Now, we brought up in one of our morning meetings <clears throat> where I was talking about this, this idea about something being a public issue and that we don't need to follow that counsel in, uh, I always forget what the verse is. It's Matthew, um, is it Matthew 12? What, what's, what's the verse where we have to follow this? Go to thy brother, be reconciled to thy brother, right? 
right? right. And, and if he doesn't hear us, you know, bring him to the church. It's Matthew 12, is that it? I always forget. Well, you all know where, where it is. So so we were talking about that one time, and somebody was saying, well, that's if, if it's just a sin between us. But if somebody has spoken something in a meeting that's not true, then then I can basically say anything I want about that person without actually having to go to him, right? We can we can paint that person in all kinds of different colors, right? No. That's what that's what people do, right? That's the I know that's what they do, but that's not what we're supposed to do. I know, but that's what people do. They take a statement. There is a statement in Spirit of Prophecy and other places. If there is an open sin, what's an open sin? Is that a person's opinion? Open sin is what? It's uh, like you're having extramarital affairs. Yeah, right. You're having an extramarital affair or you're involved in a crime or you're you're doing drugs or something and people know about it. Everybody knows about it. It's public knowledge. That's it's right. Open that, sin. That's open sin, right? But you can't just say because somebody's a public figure and he's spoken in a meeting that you can now dissect his character and, um, you know, have him for lunch. Right? No, you can't. Because that's if you have a do. problem with your brother, that's a problem between you and your brother. You might have feelings about that person. He shouldn't have said such and such a thing. Or he hurt my feelings in some way in something that he said. Or he cut me off in a meeting. Or he did this or that. So those are the types of things where we have to be able to recognize that if we have a problem with a brother... We need to deal with that brother one-on-one, -on -one. not in the court of public opinion. And if we have hurt someone, we need to go to that person and ask for forgiveness. We need to apologize for words that we said that were rash. And if we apologize for words that we said were rash, it's, it's the responsibility of that person we apologize to accept that, uh, that apology and not bring those words up again in conversations with others as if we've never apologized, right? Yes, right. But yet we don't allow people to apologize even. Somebody can apologize. They can phone you up and apologize, and be repentant, and recognize they've hurt your feelings. And yet you're still going to take that person's, the actions that they did to hurt your feelings, and you're going to still spread them abroad and hold them against that person. What, what parable is that? How about the person who had all of his debt forgiven? I mean, it's sort of like that. If we if we have had our sins forgiven, should we not also forgive others? Yes. And if somebody is repentant and we don't forgive them, whose whose responsibility is that sin now? Ours. You now own that sin. That's right. It's ours. Our words. Our words. Yeah. Excuse me. You know, I hurt someone's feelings. Well, I'll tell you plainly, I hurt Tabo's feelings because Jeff had asked me before Tabo was ordained as an elder because Tabo lived with me, what I thought of Tabo's character. So I wrote Jeff a letter and explained all of my experiences with Tabo. He was inexperienced. He cut people off. He wrote people off just having one conversation with them that if they didn't accept things that he said, also showed that Tabo was, you know, there was a lot of things about Tabo's character that I put in this letter. And then Jeff took that letter, took all of the adjectives and put them into another letter prepared for Tabo and told him, this is what I said about him. Of course, there was no context in that letter that Tabo received. But Tabo was really hurt by that. And 
So we had a meeting and I recognized that I hurt Tabo's feelings, that I hurt him with my words. Even though I could have justified them, I still asked him to forgive me. Right? Because I'd hurt him. Did it matter what I intended? I didn't make some excuse. I just said, I'm sorry that I hurt you. I don't want to hurt you. Right? I apologized for hurting him. Now, Tabo never accepted that apology. And he was proud of it. He brought it up later in a meeting, said that I never apologized, that he never apologized to me and he never would. Or he never would accept my apology. Pardon me. He didn't accept my apology and he never would accept my apology. And, and that's not a Christian. That's not a Christian way to deal with things. Not in my way of thinking. No. And, and, and Tabo brought this up in the Canadian group when we were meeting at Colin's place that he said it to everyone he, that he didn't apologize or he didn't accept my apology and he never would. And that's not a great way to be because if somebody is broken because they hurt you, we need to recognize that that person cares about you. I care about Tabo, still do. And if I could do something to help him, I would. I don't have any contact with him, and I don't think he would want to have contact with me. But if I saw him, I would not reject him. There's lots of people like that that I care about. People that I have hurt in the past, that I've tried to apologize to, that I've apologized to, but they haven't accepted my apology. They want it, they want to hold that against me. There's nothing I can do about that. Right? But there is you know, power. You did what, what you what you're supposed to do. But there is power in apologies. Yes. Sometimes people think apology is a weakness. You know, they say, Oh, you know, you shouldn't apologize. You know, you were in the right. And if you apologize, people just use it against you. And they often do. I've had many times I've apologized for things that I've done, and that person hasn't accepted that apology. And they use that apology as a confession of my faults that they can then spread abroad. Because since I, I admitted to whatever it was I did to hurt them, they now could magnify that offense. And the question is, are we going to do that? Are we going to uh, apologize? One. And the other thing is, are we going to accept the apologies of others that have hurt us? I don't see how we could reject an apology, not accept an apology. When somebody comes in heartfelt repentance for something that they have done, we need to accept that apology. So I don't really know the answer to this, right, to this problem. Because we know there's been a lot of backbiting going on. And, and people could even look at what we've been doing in our studies, and I've tried to be really open about it. We, we don't see Colin or Dilio or any of these people as the enemy. There is a message that has infected the movement, a spirit that has infected the movement. It is our responsibility to address that. But we don't attack the character of other people right? We're not spending our time in gossip or mockery about other people. We're not laughing and exulting, you know, that Colin's prediction failed. You know, some people would do that. They would make fun of Colin because his prediction failed. If we're mockers, what are we? The, the, the other side, the, the, wrong, the wrong character. We're on the wrong side. You know, and I've seen many people who were mockers in this movement. That is, they mocked the people who opposed this movement. And they turned to mock this movement as they left the movement. If you're a mocker, you're going to still be a mocker. You can, you can think you're mocking the enemy, that you're exalting in whatever... You know, you see is wrong, that you're on the side of truth. But if you're mocking people, you're on the side of error. 
and you will continue to be on the side of the error until you repent of that spirit, because that spirit will control you and consume you. So when a Seventh-day Adventist even attacks one of our brethren, let us defend him. Do we stand in defense of those who are being attacked? Not normally. Often we don't, because we don't want to be the subject of, of that fire, right? <laughs> sometimes, exactly true. sometimes when we're standing for the truth, it can feel like um, there's people on the side of the battlefield telling us, yes, go out there into the middle of the battlefield. I'm with you. But they're not with us, are they? Nope. Right. So the question is, are we defending those that are being misrepresented or attacked? Some have stood in silence as mocking has gone on. They maybe didn't like it, but they didn't say anything against it. So when he says, let us defend him in the fear of God, we need to recognize that this is in the fear of God that we defend someone. My brother's reputation is important to me because if one will attack my brother's reputation to me, he will attack mine to my brother. And that's not the only reason, but that is the truth. If I listen to tales and all these things about my brethren, then why should not other people listen to them about me? No, sir, brethren, we have to care for the reputation of our brethren. Let us stand by our brethren one with another. We have a right to rebuke this tale bearing that comes to you and me and wants to tell this, that, or the other about the brethren, we have a right to rebuke it as the spirit of Satan, that it is. The solemn, important hours that, that are now between the close of our probation and now, right? So those hours. Important what? Days or years? No, sir. The solemn, important hours. The days are gone. We are in hours. And it will not be long if we have not even now reached the time when the hours will be gone and the minutes will begin to drop. The solemn, important hours intervening between us and the judgment are not to be employed in war warfare with believers, Ellen White says. This is Satan's work. He began it in heaven, and he has with unbated energy kept it up ever since his fall. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye not be not consumed one of another. Now, we have talked about in our morning studies, what's going to happen is what happened in the story of Abimelech, um, that this fire comes out from Abimelech and devours the Shechemites, right? This is not talking about people. This is talking about messages. But people are attached to messages. And we talked about how people who are critical of others who gather together in their criticism eventually turn on one another. And so we can't afford to be at war with ourselves. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Let there not be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. The time has come when the cry of the faithful watchman is to be heard, calling to his fellow watchman, what of the night, to be answered, the morning cometh and also the night. The answer is not to be, I do not know what of the night, the answer is not to be, well, I think you are going too far ahead. I think you are going too fast. I think you are extreme. That is not to be the answer. When the call is, watchman, what of the night? The only answer that God will accept is, the morning cometh, and also the night. Then let us get ready for it. Would it not be well for us individually, this is Ellen White again, to examine closely our position before God in the light of his holy word and see our own special peril? Not to see how good we are, not to see how much better we are than our brethren, but to see our own special peril. Um, what is my peril? That is enough for me to see, to watch for my own deviltry and not watch for other people's. God does not separate from his people, but his people separate themselves from God by their own course of action. And I know of no, greater, no sins greater in the sight of God than those of cherishing jealousy and hatred toward brethren and turning the weapons of warfare against them. How could there be any greater sins? 
Is not that Satan's own action? I point my brethren to Calvary. I ask you, what is the price of man? It is the only begotten son of the infinite God. It is the price of all the heavenly treasures. That is the price of man. Then can you and I set lightly by one whom God prizes like that? One for whom God has given all the treasures of the universe? Can I set him lightly by and set him at naught and count him as of little worth? No, sir. He is worth all that God paid for him. That is what God paid for you. Am I going to count you little and mean and cheap? No, sir. I ask grace from God to enable me to count you worth all he paid for you. And I am not going to have Seventh-day Adventists even belittling you in my <laughs> I'm not going to do it. No, sir, I am not. How can I, if I love Christ who paid the price? Brethren, what is wanted is the love of Christ in our hearts. And then we will have love. We will, we will love all, all whom he loves as he loved them at the first. Evil is ever warring against good. This is Ellen White again. And since we know that the conflict with the prince of darkness is constant and must be severe, let us be united in the warfare. So Jones goes on again. You know, obviously, we need to be united in this warfare. Ellen White says, cease to war against those of your own faith. Let no one help Satan in his work. We have all that we can do in another direction. Now, when we think about this, uh, because I'm writing this paper on uh, the first fruits, the timing of the first fruits. And one of the things that I saw in, in researching this paper is that all, a lot of these churches, these ministries, these denominations have been divided. They're warring against their own men of their own faith. That is, often we are more critical of those with whom we have the most in agreement than we are of those that we differ widely from. Do you understand what I'm saying here? So here we have people in this movement. We would be in agreement in all kinds of things, but we find the things that we disagree on and those cause division. And yet we can be much more lenient to somebody who only believes a little of what we believe, right? Have you ever noticed that? Yes. yes. Okay. And yet we will war against people that we should be ministering to because they believe so much like we do. We shouldn't be warring against them. We shouldn't be gossiping about them, destroying their character, their reputations, saying this and that about them. We need to study together, even if we are in disagreement on certain points. Because there's always going to be some disagreement on certain points. Because our understanding is incomplete. But if we make those differences on different points, if we make those the issue, then we've missed what God is wanting to show us. Because often we can both be in error and yet justifying our position, thinking that the other person is the heretic. So we make people out to be heretics because they don't agree with some opinion that maybe a group of us hold or even just a few of us hold. <clears throat> Cease to war against those of your own faith. Let no one help Satan in his work. We have all that we can do in another direction, right? Um, Ellen White goes on, a passive piety will not answer for this time. Let the passiveness be manifested where it is needed. So what does she mean by a passive piety? Passive would, would imply inaction, correct? Correct. Right. So we can appear to yes. be good. We can, we can be there at the meetings. We don't participate in these actions, right? We say some nice words, but are we standing and fighting for the truth? No. 
Now, there is a passiveness that needs to be manifested where it is needed. That's patience, kindness, forbearance, right? That, that type of passiveness is needed. That's where we're not going to act out our human nature, right? Right. Okay. But we must bear a decided message of warning to the world. The Prince of Peace thus proclaimed his work. I came not to send peace on earth, but a sword. Evil must be assailed. Falsehood and error must be made to appear in their true character. You don't attack the person. You attack the falsehood and the error. And you do it from God's word. Sin must be denounced. But this doesn't mean we go about denouncing our brethren who we have differences of opinion with and use imaginary stories about how sinful or how bad that person is, how unchristlike their character is, how arrogant they are, or whatever it is we imagine about somebody else, that evil surmising, right? So the testimony of every believer in the truth must be as one. All our little differences, which arouse the combative spirit among brethren, are devices of Satan to divert minds from the great and fearful issue before us. And so has Satan come into this movement? And he's been in this movement for a long time, right? Unfortunately. Right. We know yes. that combative spirit, combative spirit, we saw with the, with the group of the December 6th uh, declaration, 2020, right? We saw people like Larry Lesher being very combative, very aggressive. All kinds of accusations, all kinds of misrepresentations of what was being said. The December 6, 2020 declaration had all kinds of misrepresentations. This was combative. It wasn't redemptive. It wasn't merciful or, or conciliatory in any sense. These were the, the devices of Satan to divert minds from the great and fearful issue before us. And that, that combative spirit is still amongst us. We need to study God's word. We need to be able to, to discuss openly and honestly, but we shouldn't make each other the enemy. Colin is not our enemy. Odilio is not our enemy. Daniel Fontenot is not our enemy. Satan is our enemy. And if we make an enemy of those who we have differences with, even if they have done things that have hurt us, even if at times they have manifested this spirit, because we have, and even at times if they, they, there are people who should have stood up in defense of us but didn't, we still can't make that person our enemy, can we? We can't afford to. We can't just say, those other people shouldn't do these things. Because we have no control over what those other people do. But we do have control over what we do. So we're going to stop there. We're going to pick this up next Friday. But I hope people received a benefit from this reading of Jones. And we can see how this is righteousness by faith. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a fairly good eye. Opener. And we need to repent. We need to confession and repentance. We need it's, to figure out how we can be re reconciled to our brother. It needs to be part of our prayers part of our thoughts, part of our actions. So let's close in prayer. Uh, yeah. I, I got to, before you sign off here, I got a okay. question you mentioned earlier about uh, Sabbath afternoon is going to be for a study for the Canadian church, you said? Oh, yeah. So we actually have a study. We're going to pick this up tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock. So we do have we are yeah, having this study. Yeah, I'm, um, having, I'm reading Jones again. I just forgot. So we'll pick this up in the afternoon. Right.
Dwight has at, a study in the morning. We pick this up in the afternoon. At 2 o'clock, right? At 2 o'clock. Thanks. For... Uh, okay, because that's not what – I don't think that's what your email said earlier. Yeah, it does. Is that what it says? Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what it uh, says. I just I – heard, I, heard I heard to say it with your mouth. That's what made me ask that question. Um, oh, wait. Maybe I did send the wrong email. Oh no, no, that's um, just trying to see here. Oh no, I sent it, I sent it right. Yeah, it says Sabbath afternoon at two p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the study this evening and for the Sabbath, and we pray for our brethren. We pray for ourselves, Lord, that we can be truly converted. We know, Lord, that it's easy to see the faults in others, but not so easy to see and acknowledge the faults in ourselves. We ask for forgiveness. We pray, Lord, that you can continue this work that you have begun and that you can bring this movement together in unity. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.